Um, it's very good that we had Michelle talking before and we will have Alia and Ali. All of them had participated in Venice Biennale of Architecture and I think that's a good example of how this region or how the, the discussions about this region have been uh, moving on there. And I think this event is part, it's part of that understanding of how architecture can contribute to the dialogues that Michelle already talked about, uh, but also to the dialogues that Rohan was talking. So I'm basically here to uh, first explain uh, where I came from in terms of research and uh, what I've been working till now and where I'm going on from now. So I will just uh, explain briefly a book that will be publishing uh, soon uh, on uh, what we call Pan-Arab Modernism. Uh, and then I will talk about this idea of architecture without cities, which is a new project that we are currently working on. But they basically work around these two ideas. One is this uh, notion of the Pan-Arab movement as a, a vehicle for modernization and urbanization. Uh, mainly if we look at the late 1950s uh, and all over 60s until early 70s, uh, this ambition of a common identity throughout the peninsula was part of, of, of the project uh, of urbanizing and modernizing, especially the urban environment. Uh, and then on the other hand, I'm pretty much interested as a practitioner on this notion of translocal practice, which goes along with all this project of transnational exchanges. Um, so this is, is part of, of the book I mentioned that will be soon published. Uh, and one of, one of the interesting things is while developing the book, we start looking uh, at the scale of the territory, which I personally uh, was, was aware but never dedicated that much time, which is the fact that we basically have a peninsula that has cities on the, on the, on the extremes of, of its perimeter, and in the middle we have very little uh, to talk about. And this, this for me has been, has been relevant to understand how movement and mobility of people worked in the region. So the, the Pan-Arab movement uh, was part of that ambition that I think never fully realized. And we worked on this project as an opportunity that came from the 50 years of a corporate office of architecture and engineering in Kuwait, which is Pan-Arab consulting engineers who devoted to us their archive and their archive fully covers the construction of many buildings throughout the region between 1968 and 2018. And that was opportunity for me, Sara Saragossa and Dalal Asair to develop this project. Um, so uh, along this project, one of the very strong evidences of this relation between modernization, urbanization and the translocal practice is expressed on this quote from Charles Haddad, which is one of the founders of this Kuwaiti firm, who says that the issues of physical development, specifically in countries of the developing world, are not easily identified by those dealing and living with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is something for me as a foreigner that came to Kuwait 10 years ago was very sensitive because that was already my understanding of my own region and that ha is something that has been leading my practice and I think the practice of many of the people that are in the region. So uh, recently I have co-worked in these two books. One is basically about, uh, it's a survey of buildings similar to what Michelle had developed here, not so deep in terms of how the buildings were lived, is more on an architectural perspective. So we collected plans, we collected authors, times, processes of development. And then there is a second book, which we called SIS Arguments and Interviews, which basically cover that space of the, the making of these buildings, not through the ones who use them, but basically through the ones who conceive them. Uh, and that's actually something we are now working on in this Pan-Arab project where we were able to get into another layer of understanding of these buildings. And I think through that I'm, 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 I'm able to then expand some of the discussions later. But uh, in this book basically we were concerned in using the methodologies and the framework developed before to understand the archive of PACE in this case. So we developed a body of interviews 
including many Indian architects that came to Kuwait in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and, and we understood what was their position in this space of production of a whole region. Uh, then we also um, delivered some um, requests for articles from different experts in the region to understand specific niches of research. And we developed our own uh, subjects of interest, which are divided in these 10 chapters. And these 10 chapters go over different sections of what we understand are the dialogues around the construction of this idea of a pan-Arab uh, understanding of the territory. Uh, these different subjects, they would understood as ways to dissect the position of the buildings in their environment. And many of them are very urban conscient. Uh, and that's something that over time I start to struggle with. I'm coming personally, so these are chronologies of the book that I'm just showing, but I'm, I'm coming from the south of Portugal where basically there, there are no modern cities. What we have is some small towns that became touristical resorts. Very similar in my own abstraction of what happened in this region where small towns became oil-rich cities. Uh, without going through this normal process of development of the city, which establishes many of the rhetorics of the modern architect, as we heard, for example, before with Rohan, with this idea of places such as Chandigarh or even Mumbai. Um, but this is something that I'm particularly um, stressing here, which is the fact that normally when we talk about modernization of this region in particular, we focus mainly on the urban development. And modernization and development is always associated with this idea of city. So. Together with that, the notion of future of these cities is being seen as the way to go through the understanding of global warming, climate challenges. All these things are being always read through cities. So the, the presentation that I would bring here today is more about looking at the practice of architecture and looking at the conception with these buildings without considering the cities as part of their process. So, um, this is an image from a scene in the offices of PACE in Kuwait around 1975 discussing a building that today is very relevant in the cityscape. But in this picture what we see is people from all different nationalities, so people from Jordania, India, United States, uh, discussing a project of architecture. And that's the beginning of, of my interest, is basically understanding how the contribution of these different people combining their conventional knowledges of where they come from and where they are living, uh, produced unconventional architecture that today we discuss and we debate about what it represents or what it belongs to. Are we talking about a local critical regionalism? Are we talking about an import and export of, of, of models, of buildings? So, uh, following the movements uh, in, in the 1950s that defined uh, states and even new nations and also the understanding of a new world that emerges out of the 1960s uh, that is focused not anymore on this idea of ethnicity or the idea of ownership and territorial control that is more focused on the operations of trade and commerce. I think this was a whole new opportunity for the practice of architecture that of course indulge in a series of, of new understandings of, of this region that are expressed in, for example, here on the left, we have a study that was published in the late 1970s in Kuwait about a new understanding of the country uh, and, and basically is, is a very optimist, optimist understanding of the country with no fears of territorial domains, with no fears of who belonging to. And then on the right, we have a pure uh, commercial understanding of, of the country where an advertisement of the National Bank of Kuwait, which is a private company, not the Central Bank of Kuwait, uses the idea of a city as Kuwait to define their new relation uh, with, with the region. Um, so here we, we basically see how the urbanization of, of the region took a lead. So until 1900, we have about 20% of the overall population of, of this region as urban. And only in recent decades, after the oil um, uh, 
the old condition, let's say. Uh, we have places as Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, and UAE becoming completely urbanized territories. Of course, this, this is data available by uh, United Nations, but by a fact, we understand that the population and the rural population dramatically reduced in all this region. Another phenomenon that I think is relevant to understand in this framework is the understanding of who inhabits these places. And on the left, we can see the yellow as foreign or expat and the grey as, as ci local citizen. Uh, and we understand that the proportion and the relation between those who are the hosts and those who are the guests changed dramatically the way in which these regions were produced. And on the bottom, we have a world migration chart that show you how increasing from 1960s onwards the number of, of people moving from place to place. So, uh, I basically organized this presentation in this relation between modernization, urbanization, and translocal culture. So my interest is in understanding this practice of architecture without the legacy of a pre-existing city uh, developed by strangers who embraced localness. Uh, through Pan-Arab Modernism and Architecture Without the City thesis, the aim is to develop the methodologies and the framework to understand the translocal practice of architecture. So for me, coming from Portugal, I, I have a completely different reading of this region. Uh, culturally, for me, we are talking about an extension of the Mediterranean uh, exchange of cultures, which puts me in a different relation towards the region than the notion of the Arabic Gulf and the relation with Southern Asia. And I think that is, is a contribution I wanted to bring here. Uh, so on the top, we have a map of the Mediterranean since the 9th century before Christ, where we see how the overlap between cultures uh, defined a very unique and a very dense geography on the world. So I come from a town in the south of Portugal that during 500 years was under uh, uh, an Islamic rule. Um, however, uh, things in the 1960s change, and over there on the top right we have a map that shows you in black the EFTA, which was the competing free trade organization with the European Union. So EFTA was established in 1960, European Union was established in 1957, and both define uh, a lot of relations between parts in Europe that play the role, a contrasting role, with the OPEC that was also established in the 1960s. And on the bottom, we have basically a map from Sabah Shibar book, Kuwait Urbanization, that demonstrates the attraction of the Gulf uh, in, terms as, in terms of a region to capture uh, in intellectual uh, efforts, and the black arrows has the idea of exporting outside the Gulf things like architecture, like paste uh, And on the bottom left, we have a, a recent uh, map that shows us the, the migrations from uh, the war in Syria and other events in the region in the Mediterranean that eventually will activate in further years to come the region again as a, a very dense point of exchange. So the, this is a map from the 11th century that was produced in Egypt uh, that shows an understanding of the Mediterranean that is based on islands and cities. And, and I think all over, all over the history uh, of um, social and human sciences, the understanding of this region has be, been based on this idea again, the idea of an urbanized environment. Uh, to the extent that from the 1960s onwards, uh, the, the, the pressure of an urban society brings a notion of a total urbanization of the world, which disregards the elements that compose uh, that built environment. Uh, even the architects themselves, basically in the mid 19th, 20th century, have focused their project or their agenda in this idea of, of city. So these are two images, one of the construction of Sawaber uh, project, which is a, a housing, a massive housing project in Kuwait. Uh, so on the left we have the construction and on the right we have its demolition, that it's taking place by now. Uh, and, and I think this, this is where I would like to leave a question here, is uh, what eventually went wrong, that we built uh, uh, housing for, uh, with almost 900 units, in 1981, 82, that were occupied in 1986. And today, in 2019, we are demolishing it. And, and for that reason, I went over this understanding of, of, of the practice, which basically uh, 
looks into different architects. So my present research, City uh, Architecture Without City, looks into different common practitioners, including PACE. And here we have Hamid Shweb, which is uh, a Kuwaiti that was one of the founders of PACE. But also look into other practitioners, such as Antonio Teixeira Guerra in Portugal, that was part of the establishment of EFTA, uh, or Manuel Trillo in Sevilla, that was one or among the first class of graduates from the University of Sevilla. Um, these are two of the buildings the Portuguese and the Spanish produced. But what I understand is that at a certain point we are talking about the generation of architects that is part of this exchange. And we are talking about people that eventually were raised in one country, educated in another country and practiced in another country. Uh, and I see that as an opportunity uh, to understand the architecture that was being developed in this region as a translocal practice rather than uh, uh, a result of the modernization or development of ur urban centers. So for example here we have a, one of the first buildings, it's actually project number one or two of PACE that was developed in Kuwait in association with uh, uh, Iraq Consult which is a firm that was established in Baghdad in the late 1950s by three partners, one of them Rifat Shadiji. And this is, this is basically a building that was, was built in the middle of a, a very dense neighborhood that had no plan at that time, that was not part of, of Kuwait master plan from the 1950s, where the architect was trying to define somehow a universe uh, by itself that brings together all these references. So it brings together his own culture from his own country uh, with what uh, he learned at school. And I think this is one of the quotes that best defines that, which is, uh, which is a quote from Rifat Shadidji book, Concepts and Influences, from uh, 1982, where basically he describes that this work drew its inspiration from two different sources, the combination of which seemed contradictory to colleagues from both East and West. First, I was determined to produce designs, projects, which would satisfy the complex needs of oil-rich contemporary developing urban society in this case, Iraq. These designs, projects, would be based on my awareness and acceptance of modern Western aesthetic values and technology as part of an international culture and a global economic system. Secondly, and apparently incompatibly, I was determined to refer consciously to regional traditional values, to allow them to influence me, to produce buildings that were congenital to the values of these ancient and traditional cultures, and to experiment which the, with the aim of generating a modern regional architecture. Yes. Um, so these are basically some of the images that describe that environment. And here I have just another quote that I think is relevant from him, which is, until the modern era, the dissemination and export of form from one culture to another was usually accepted or even sought by the recipient culture. The incorporation of foreign influence within the local technology would take place more or less unconsciously. A performer was not forced to consider which of a number of options to incorporate within this traditional and conventional technology because such imported interventions were subjected to a slow process of trial and error before they were accepted or rejected by tradition. It was a process of cultural osmosis within the capacity of that tradition. In this way, the dissemination of form in the pre-modern era was almost always accepted unconsciously or acquiesced in as natural development of that tradition and culture. So in this way, I have here just to finish two buildings. So the building I showed you before that Pace did with Iraq Consult in 1968 that was completed in 1971-72. And a second building on the bottom, which is the building that was being discussed in the meeting I showed you before, which is a building where Pace is not anymore searching a collaboration with a local entity as Iraq Consult, but searching a collaboration with an international counterparty from Boston, United States, which is the Architects Collaborative. And I think what is interesting is to understand what is between these two buildings and what sort of information we can release uh, throughout this idea of transnational practice. So I, I just finished here with these two images. So 
One is basically that same picture with some notes of Resham Singh, which took his degree in Chandigarh, uh, and basically worked in Mumbai, Delhi, Tehran, and then came to Kuwait, and was just putting notes of who were these people while we were doing the research. And the other, the second image, is an image in Bahrain during uh, Kuwait invasion. So Pace moved to Bahrain during Kuwait invasion, where we have Hamid Shuaib, the man that I showed you before, the Kuwaiti architect who established Pace, with Michael Gebert, which is uh, an American from Boston that worked at the Architects Collaborative since 1972 all the way to 1990, um, and just died recently. So I was able to talk with many of these people, which I think it's relevant, and this is something Michelle was mentioning, the opportunity we have to still understand this generation and how this generation passed over to ours. Thank you.